Welcome to our Victorian Barroom Christmas episode. We were very excited to do this because you can't not have a special Christmas episode on a Victorian show. So much of what we think of as traditional Christmas celebration originates in the Victorian period. Obviously, Christmas goes back a lot sooner than or a lot earlier than that, but between Charles Dickens and Queen Victoria and Prince Albert and the trends that were happening then, all of these all of these Things that we consider traditional now really came out of this period. And it's one of my favorite times of year. I look forward to it the whole time. Uh, and so we are celebrating Christmas right here on the Victorian Bar Room. And as you can see, we are back at the Conrad Caldwell House Museum. I've got Chris Kirkland, assistant director, here with me, and Margaret. Young. Margaret Young, the great-granddaughter of William and Elaine Caldwell, who were the second owners of the house, right? Absolutely. So can you tell us a little bit about your family? Well, William came to Louisville in 1883. Uh, he originally came here in order to rebuild a distillery. And he liked Louisville so well and Kentucky so well that he decided to move his family here. So by 1885, the entire family was moved here and uh, they settled here in Old Louisville. Uh, he established his company, W. Caldwell Company, uh, which morphed into Caldwell Tanks, and that company is still in existence. Uh, they built uh, water tanks and towers primarily, uh, but of course, back in my great-grandfather's day, they were known for a lot of the distilleries and the breweries. Uh, and he had several patents uh, for some of the equipment that was used uh, in those uh, uh, buildings and in the uh, processing uh, of you know, the equipment that they used in order to uh, create those uh, beverages. So uh, we've been here a long time. My family lived here from roughly 1906 to 1938. They sold the property in 1940. This recipe that we're going to be talking about, we're going to get a little <laughs> bit outside of our Victorian comfort zone, but it's going to be worth it, all right? We're edging into the Edwardian period because Margaret is going to be sharing with us her family's eggnog recipe from the Edwardian period that has never been shared publicly before, and I have heard wonderful things about it. And so they've actually gone in and they've taken the notes that they had from that period and they've done the same thing we do on this show as far as figuring out okay, what exactly did this mean. Uh, and we're going to learn about this recipe. Now, eggnog, of course, did go well back into the Victorian period and very far uh, before that. Uh, I guess we don't really know when they started making this, do we? Not really. Um, I know the recipe we have in my great-grandmother's handwriting was somewhere 1907, 1912, somewhere in there. Yeah. Um, I don't remember the exact date, but um, that's something. Uh, my mother made this religiously every party she had during the holidays and would take it to other friends' homes when they would have a party uh, because it was just so special. Right. So let's get into this real taste of the past that has never been made public anywhere before now. We're going to meet the ingredients. Elaine, Margaret, what are we working with? Well, one of the special ingredients for this particular recipe is ice cream. So we softened ice cream. It's just vanilla ice cream. And uh, you soften that so that you can incorporate it into the um, overall uh, eggnog at the, at the end. Uh, this recipe, we're using six eggs. So we have egg whites and, uh, of course, the egg yolks that we divide, whipping cream, sugar, and, of course, the booze. So that's pretty much it. Uh, of course, I have some nutmeg for putting on the top. Now, my mother always swore by the fresh nutmeg because it has a much better flavor to it. So uh, we'll be sprinkling that on top once we uh, serve it. So let's meet the spirits that we're going to be using today. Now, you said that Mr. Caldwell's office was right near E.L. Weller, right? Absolutely. They were actually quite close friends, from what I understand, and he did a lot of work with both the Stitzel and the Weller uh, distilleries. Right. So Weller has come down to us as a weeded bourbon now. And of course, the famous Pappy Van Winkle uh, is a weeded bourbon. I do have some Weller at home, but I'm not going to mix it with anything under any circumstances. <laughs> so uh, we are going to use Larceny today for a few reasons. It, it's a weeded bourbon. It's a very good weeded bourbon. I always enjoyed it. Uh, and then I saw a show that Greg from How to Drink did recently where he got a hold of a bottle of Pappy and he did a blind taste test 
of all these different weeded bourbons to see if he could figure out which one was the pappy just based on how awesome it was. And Larceny was on top almost right up until the end. It barely got edged out uh, by a, a Weller variety. So I'm feeling pretty good about Larceny. We can get it for about 25 bucks here in Kentucky. Uh, we were having a discussion beforehand. It said uh, a pint <laughs> in the original recipe. It's like, okay, we're talking about 16 ounces or 20 ounces. Uh, Margaret said, well, let's go with the lower one. Chris said, let's go with the higher one. Uh, so uh, we, we compromised and we're going to do, or 16 ounces is two cups. 20 ounces of two and a half cups. So we're gonna do two, two and a quarter cups of, of bourbon, see where that gets us. Uh, rum, we're gonna use a quarter cup of rum. You can use whatever rum you like. Now you say you like to use a black rum a lot of times, yes. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I decided this time we are going to use, uh, this is the Spirits of French Lick, uh, Stamper's Creek, American Rum, Work of Master Distiller, Alan Bishop. He pops up on this show a lot, you might have noticed. Um, I like the way this blends with pre-prohibition cocktails because it's got just enough of that pot distilled character that it blends and complements and doesn't overpower. Uh, so what's our first step? Well the first thing we're going to do is divide the eggs. So we separated the eggs into egg whites and egg yolks. So we had six eggs. So I'm going to take my, uh, I have five already done here. So I'm going to take the last egg. So we're going to crack the egg. I've got five eggs in here already separated. And we don't want any of those egg yolk in that egg whites because it just won't whip up as well if you have that. So I'll hand that off. And then we're going to whip up the egg whites. Now I recommend that probably in, in today's world you're going to want to do this on a, a mixer, uh, but we can at least start it with a whisk. And you want those until they're stiff. So we've got the egg whites with pretty stiff and you can see how stiff they are. We want them that way because we want to be able to fold those in and incorporate all that airiness into the eggnog. Okay now we're going to take the egg yolks and we're going to blend those. So we're going to use the same uh, whisk and thank mm -hmm. you. And we're going to blend those and whisk them just until they're get some air in those as well. And now comes the fun part. We're going to add the liquor into that. So we've got two and one quarter cup of Larceny Weeded Bourbon. You can use what you like, but I'm telling you folks, quality and price point, this is good and a quarter cup of our rum. We are using Spirits of French Lick, Stamper's Creek, American Rum. You can use what you like. Chris prefers a black one. Now, I, I do want to say my great-grandmother and my mother uh, always said that if you follow this recipe and the procedures, that it will not separate. So you actually can make this the day before. And oftentimes with um, eggnog, it does separate and you'll have um, kind of a, a runny layer at the bottom of the bowl when you go to serve it. Um, mother never had that issue with, with this particular recipe. So now we're going to fold in, I'm going to let you have the whisk. Okay. We're going to fold in the egg whites. And I'm hoping this is going to be a big enough bowl. We may have to switch over to this punch bowl in a minute. So we're going to fold in, and you just got to be real gentle with these egg whites because you don't want to flatten them. So it just takes a few minutes to kind of incorporate all that and break those up just enough. But you can see I'm still leaving some fluff in there so that the... Uh, air is not, uh, or the egg whites aren't flattened, you want to make sure you keep that air in those egg whites because that's part of that texture and what makes this recipe so good. Uh, if you were raised on store-bought eggnog, you will not believe the difference the real eggnog makes. Yeah, I made this for a holiday party on a whim. Uh, I've never 
drank eggnog. I don't. Oh, well, I can't say I never drank eggnog. Uh, I've always drank the store bought eggnog, and I just can't handle it. Um, <laughs> I, the taste, the texture, and when I made this, uh, I will never go back to anything else. So I just want to get some of these larger lumps broken up a little bit. Now we're going to add sugar when we get this done. So on this recipe with six eggs, we're going to use a half a cup of sugar. And we just use plain sugar on this. I'm sure you could probably get a fancier sugar if you wanted to. But uh, my mother always just used the standard granulated sugar on this. Oh, pretty good. So we're going to add this half cup of sugar. And again, we're just going to kind of gently incorporate that in. Trying not to flatten those egg white. And that's just about ready to add our whipping cream. So we have, uh, what is it, a pint of whipping cream? Mm -hmm. A pint of whipping cream that we're going to, again, uh, take back to our mixer and we want to uh, beat that until it's stiff. Okay, now I need more room in order to incorporate the last few ingredients. So I'm going to dump the egg mixture, that's the egg uh, yolks, egg whites, sugar and bourbon and rum. We're going to mix that, put that in our punch bowl so that we can now incorporate the rest of the ingredients. Now here's those whipped cream and you can see what, how, what a beautiful consistency that is. And this was cream that was whipped, not whipped cream from the store. Exactly. Yeah. It's not like the, that canned stuff. This is the real thing. Again, you know, when you use the fresher ingredients and do it yourself, it's such a, there's a vast improvement in the yes. flavor profile here. And guys, it's, it's okay if you use an electric mixer. We didn't have them in the Victorian period, but it's okay. Yeah, this would require quite a strong arm in order to do it by hand. So I'm sure that's one of the reasons why they didn't do this as much <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> back in the day. This was a special treat because, I mean, this, this would have taken a lot of time to do by hand. Now we're just going to very carefully fold this together. And again, we don't want to lose all that air that we just put into those ingredients. So just very gently, you're gonna fold. And I don't know if you know about folding, but you do just kind of a circular motion with your, uh, your tool, and you just kinda take that stuff from the bottom, pull it up to the top, and then go back again. So you just very gently mix that together and you want to fully incorporate that because you don't want to have a bite of just whipped cream. You want to have all the flavor from the eggs and the, the liquors uh, throughout. And there's a note on the recipe, isn't there, about you can actually make this ahead of time? Yes. Yeah. And if you follow the procedure, my mother always said it will not separate. So you can make it the day ahead uh, and it should still be just as good as it was uh, the day you make it. Now, I wouldn't make it too far in advance. Right. Mm -hmm. well, this... And as Chris's experience shows, it's hard <laughs> to keep a whole recipe if you make it too far ahead. Too. I was going to say, I make it the day of, and I, it never makes it past the day that I make it <laughs> right. because of how delicious it is. So. so it might not make it long enough to save for the next day, but you no. can. Yes. I have never been able to test the theory that it does not separate <laughs> beyond a day. Well, I know when my mom made head parties and she would make this uh, she usually catered the uh, herself the entire meal uh, for the or all the uh, foods for that party gotcha so she would make this the day in advance uh, it was just one less thing that she had to do well I think okay, that on the pretty uh, good based on the proportions we were talking about with what we're doing here four times this did not serve 40 people right 
Right. Yeah. So she suggested doing six times this if you're doing 40 people or more. <laughs> well, and that was from experience because yeah. she would have parties with 48 easily. Okay, now we're going to, I'm going to break up this ice cream a little bit so it'll blend in easier. And this is just regular vanilla ice cream, right? Plain vanilla yeah. ice cream, and we've let it sit out for, oh, an hour, give or take. Nice and soft. And mm -hmm. so it's soft enough that it should be able to blend in pretty easily. So then we're going to take this, and this is really what makes this recipe so special. Because once you add this ice cream, it gives it a richness that you just don't get in any other of the uh, eggnog recipes that I've ever seen. The, this ice cream really does set it above. I'm going to hand that off. Yep. And again, we're just going to fold that in. This is looking amazing. Well, you see the texture, it's just, yeah. it's, it's almost velvety. It is. And, you know, this is how I was raised on eggnog. And I think that was one of the reasons that my mom was a firm believer that uh, if you teach responsible drinking, <laughs> that you won't have a drinking problem drawing, you know, when, you're, when you're older. And I, I really think that was true because this was always one of my favorite things that she would make. Um, I used to love whenever she had a party, sneak, <laughs> sneak drinks of this. So, uh, and Margaret had the least bourbon of anybody today, so it apparently worked. <laughs> it, it did. All right, and that is the eggnog recipe. Oh my goodness. Now you have to top it with um, uh, fresh nutmeg. Okay, so we're going to top the batch, not the glasses. I'm going to top the glasses. Okay, Because gotcha. I like a lot of nutmeg. Yes. And if you top the, the, now mother would usually sprinkle a little bit on this. Okay. But I find it's best to, to top the glasses because right. then you get a good serving of the, that fresh nutmeg. You, you, want to, you want to serve this? Yeah, I can serve. Yeah, so, we gosh, it's so velvety even oh like dipping gosh. in. Oh my gosh. And it's thick. It's almost like a dessert. Yes. <laughs> and I'm going to top it with some of that fresh nutmeg. Okay. Yeah. Let's give it a taste. Brian, thank you. See what you think, Brian. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays, everyone. Oh, my Lord have mercy. That's how you do it, isn't it? Yeah, that is. I've, I've never had anything quite like that. Well, it's so light. And oh, my gosh. Fluffy. Yeah. 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 The texture, it just is unique. Yeah. Um, you're not going to get anything like this with store-bought no. eggnog. No. no. But, I mean, this is how you do eggnog yeah. as far as I'm concerned. Um I find it hard to drink eggnog at parties because mm -hmm. it's not my grandma's recipe. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I, I, I can't even, I can't say drinking velvet because I referred to the brandy sangaree as that and this is different. Um, it's yeah. just like. It's just so soft and pillowy. Mm -hmm. Soft and pillowy. Yeah, that's what I was trying to get to. It's, yeah. it's like a down pillow um, in a good way. Um, I'm saying um a lot because I don't know what to say. It's just incredible. Well, I mean, and the alcohol profile really works well with it. Yeah. It does. Because it doesn't overpower and no. it, doesn't, it doesn't slam that, you know, hey, I'm filled with booze. No. Right. I think I would probably get filled up with this before I got seriously intoxicated. <laughs> it's possible because there's, yeah. I mean, there's a lot in this. Yeah. I will say this. I have a teacup at home that has the mustache guard, and I feel like I need with this, this especially. <laughs> I, need to, I need to have that teacup yeah. because it's all I can. I can feel it getting into my whiskers a little bit. <laughs> it's like I don't know. It's it's like an amazing like like what a milkshake should be like an adult's milkshake should. There be. you have it. With yeah, with the, with just the perfect amount of Christmassiness to it. I. I didn't expect this. I, I, I did not expect that this really? is what we were coming into. Yeah, because I've had period eggnogs before, and they're wonderful, but this is very unique. Um, it is 100% a taste, in this case, of the Edwardian era right here in Louisville, Kentucky. And Absolutely. the first time it's been made public. And so I really appreciate you and the Caldwell family uh, being willing to share this with us here on the Victorian Barroom today. Well, this is one of those family recipes that... Uh, Years ago, my mom put together a, a cookbook of all the family 
recipes, and this was one of the star pieces of it. Gotcha. Um, we don't have a lot of recipes from that era, but mm -hmm. we do have a handful of them. And, and this is one that really stands the test of time. <laughs> yes. I mean, I think it's as good now as when I first had it. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, guys, there's nothing in this that you can't get at the grocery store, okay? Mm -hmm. So give it a try. You don't have to do these specific uh, spirits. You know, you can use whatever uh, whiskey you like. You can use whatever rum you like. You can substitute cognac if you want to uh, for the whiskey. Just give it a try. Take the time. Appreciate it. Um, there's plenty of hard times going on out there. You know, there, there's, there's plenty of rough stuff happening right now. But uh, it's the Christmas season. Mm -hmm. And... The Victorians, again, like we said in the first in the first part of the show, really gave us what we consider traditional Christmas celebrations. So I think those are best in the hard times. So embrace the season, take the time, make something really wonderful, whether it's this or something else. And from all of us here on the Victorian Bar Room, from the Conrad Caldwell House, a happy Christmas, happy Christmas. to everybody. Merry Christmas. All right, so I've been managed to pull been pulled away from my cup of eggnog while you guys enjoy. That's not easy. Uh, no, it is not. <laughs> um, but as Brian said, um, Margaret uh, and the Caldwell family were very uh, generous enough to allow us uh, to allow the Victorian Ballroom to come in and film this Christmas episode and showcase a recipe that has been uh, hidden uh, in secret with their family for many, many years uh, to the general public. Um, and uh, more, uh, more importantly, Margaret has also um, allowed uh, the Conrad Caldwell House Museum to create a signature tea towel this year for the holiday season uh, with, the, uh, with Grandma Caldwell's eggnog recipe <laughs> uh, emblazoned on the front of this flour sack tea towel. Um, it's actually very special because, uh, well, do you want to tell them why this tea towel is special as far as the, the overall writing on it? Well, for me, when I look at this, I'm thrilled because this is in my mother's handwriting. So uh, I know this will definitely be in everybody's stocking for my family uh, because we all recognize this, uh, you know, off the bat as being my mom's handwriting. And I just love that we're doing this and that we're going to be able to share it. Yeah, absolutely. And hopefully um, this all... Uh, the proceeds of this will benefit the museum. Absolutely. And my family is very closely tied in with the museum. Of course, we were the uh, second family that lived here. There were only two families that lived here. And so we love this building, uh, and we want it to continue for another 100 years. So proceeds from this will help uh, do that. So buy lots <laughs> well that's one thing that i really wanted to point out during this episode guys I, I think a lot of times we go to these places these historic houses uh, and people assume it's a state it's park they're tax funded something like that this is a private 501c3 okay this this exists because people will it to exist this they have to raise all the money to make this happen themselves so everything that you do whether it's <laughs> buying a tea towel whether it's uh, sending them a donation which we're going to put a link to down below it helps this place to continue so if you want to if you want to see this place continue other places like this please help them out every little bit really does help and we would really appreciate it to keep these places going so thank you so much Oh.
Oh, oh, oh.